they did the right thing procedurally. Does it produce the outcome that I want? Probably not. This session of the Supreme Court has made some disgusting decisions. If that's what you think, this episode of Right Angle is for you. Hi, I'm Scott Ott with Bill Whittle and Stephen Green. The members at uh, BillWhittle.com have made Right Angle possible. And if you'd like to support their efforts, you can join them and get to unlock backstage content as well as interact with them in exclusive members-only dialogue features of the website. Or you can just give us a thumbs up to get started. Um, that would be helpful, and we appreciate it. Uh, gentlemen, uh, the Supreme Court has had a, uh, an historic uh, session uh, this year, and the decisions being announced, especially with regard to gun control and abortion, have gotten great headlines uh, and even prayer at the 50-yard line after a football game privately by an assistant coach. <laughs> these, are, these are considered to be big decisions, and I've heard from a loved one recently how disgusted they were with the choices that the Supreme Court made. And it occurred to me, I don't know if this is for the first time, but close to it, Steve Green, it occurred to me that what the person was really saying is, uh, the Supreme Court is in the business of making moral evaluations. And I don't like the decisions they made because I disagree with the outcome of that opinion. And therefore, these were bad decisions. Uh, but Steve, that's not how the Supreme Court was fashioned uh, by the framers of the Constitution. That's not its purpose at all. They're not about the business of making moral pronouncements. And really, uh, they're, they're in the business of just deciding who gets to decide rather than deciding. Do you think you could, in somewhat elementary language, uh, flesh that out for us a little bit so maybe people won't be so angry? Uh, you know, when I was when I was little, I had this uh, concept of God, probably not an uncommon one for little kids is the uh, the the big old guy with the long white beard sitting in the in the big throne and making pronouncements on what was good and what was bad and who was good and who was bad. And it's a, it's a very childlike uh, vision of God. And that is kind of the progressive last view of the Supreme Court. It's, it's, it's very childlike. It's, oh, well, if the court decides something is good, then we can all do it. And if the court decides something is bad, none of us should do it. And if I disagree with those decisions, then we have to expand it to enough justices that they will all agree with me. Um, it's, it's really childlike, and I don't mean that as a compliment. You know, the uh, the founders had a real problem on their hands when they were trying to replace the Articles of Confederation. Um, I hate using the word democracy because we're not a democracy. We're a we're a constitutional republic that has democratic elections. Um, and that was one of the founders solutions to this problem. The problem being democracy had never worked on the scale of anything larger than a city state before. And yeah. when it came to most of those city states, it didn't work very well or for very long. Uh, go, go back to read your, read your history of Athens and what a mess their democracy was, even though it was just one city of fairly like-minded people sharing a, a, a single culture. So the founders looked at this massive United States of, uh, of 1781 or so, uh, you know, we're pretty much just 4 million farmers hugging the, the and, and merchants hugging the, the, the strip of the East Coast. Um, we were much more alike then than we are today. But even then, the founder said, how do you weld this many people, this, this weird agglomeration of different people into one nation? And their solution was federalism, uh, what de Tocqueville called an incomplete national government. Uh, in those areas where the Constitution gives the federal government power, the federal government is supreme. In those areas that uh, the Constitution reserves to the state or the people or that the Constitution does not mention, the federal government is hands off because that was the way the founders realized is the only way you can you can you can meld all of these very different peoples into one nation that kind of sort of functions. And as I said, we were much more alike back then as a whole than we are today. We have a lot more diversity today. I'm fine with that. But this diversity reinforces the need for federalism. 
it makes the case for federalism stronger, not weaker, so that the, 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 my, my weirdo friends in California can do their thing, my social conservative friends in Alabama can do their thing, and my, my elite urban friends in New York can do their thing, and we can all manage to coexist. You see that thing on the bumper sticker that says coexist? <laughs> You can't coexist in a top-down system. You need federalism. Uh, Bill Whittle, there's a, one of the Supreme Court justices in the Dobbs versus Women's Health uh, or Jacksonville Women's – was it Jackson Women's Health Organization, the uh, the famous Dobbs case that overturned Roe versus Wade and Casey versus Planned Parenthood, uh, made the remark that the Constitution is silent on the matter of abortion. And so the upshot of the Dobbs case was not – uh, that suddenly abortion is illegal, it's that the federal government has nothing to say about it. Um, there is another case in New York that had to do with gun control. And the Supreme Court basically struck down the New York law that restricted somebody's uh, right to keep and bear arms. The Constitution is not silent on the matter of guns and gun ownership. And so, therefore, it is in the federal purview. And so what, I'm, what I see when I look at the Supreme Court's decisions is not a matter of, you know, a, a half dozen people or five people in black robes ruling over the rest of it. it in least, at least in this session, it's justices saying, look, you brought this to us. This is not on our table. This is not on the federal table. Kick that back to the states, which have the police power to regulate, for example, uh, things involving the death of an individual, which is what abortion would be. Uh, send that to the state level. Let the people decide. Bill, it's the, it's the people's court. And this is the most democratic session of the Supreme Court, I think, in history. Why so much pushback from the left? Well, there's a lot of things uh, in play here. Um, first of all, the people who are condemning the uh, Supreme Court decision uh, as illegitimate are the people who say that they've overturned their constitutional right to an abortion. Remember when we had civics classes in this country and we would sit there in elementary school and we'd learn about how the government works and how this works and how that works and it hasn't been here for 25, 30, 40 years now. It's not an accident. Nobody understands how it works. When I, was, when I started doing the virtual president thing about 10 years ago, the big topic then in those quaint times was gay marriage, whether gay marriage should be legal or not. And I was functioning as the virtual president of the United States. And I said, you know, here I am as the president of the United States. People ask me what I think about gay marriage. It's not about my personal opinion. I look at the Constitution and I find out that gay marriage isn't mentioned in the Constitution. And you know what else? Straight marriage isn't mentioned in the Constitution either. Yeah. And that's telling me that as virtual president of the United States, it's got nothing to do with me. I just got an opinion just like anybody else. It's not in my domain. And the reason that the left is, is, is so upset about this, Scott, is because despite, despite the fact that they're constantly talking about democracy, their, their politics have not been the result of democratic processes. Their politics for the last 40 years have been the result of an oligarchy. If they can't convince more than half of the American people to send representatives to Washington and get the legislation that they want, then they realize that, okay, if we can convince five out of nine people, five people, if we can convince five people to vote with us, then we basically get everything we want. It doesn't matter what the voters say. So, so the court has always been there. It's been there. It's been their bludgeon, and essentially it's been their escape route. If there's, a, if there's a policy that they want that could never be passed legislatively, they'll legislate from the bench. And as long as they had five Supreme Court justices, they were able to do all the stuff, including Roe v. Wade and all the rest of it. The thing that strikes me the most about the, the modern progressives is just how unbelievably out of touch they are and how much further out of touch they become every single day. This was the, this, we've talked about this before, not too long ago. Roe v. Wade was the tripwire. It was the, it was the third rail. It was the thing that would cause the left to come out in numbers untold. And, and essentially it was the same thing as gun confiscation. Well, second now, first time when it was leaked and now after the decision has been announced, after it's dust is settled, they do polls and they find out Republicans gained a few points. 
So the country is changing back to a much more conservative country, almost exclusively because we've seen what happens when we become a progressive country. We've tried all these ideas that sound really good. You know, it's like we're free health care. You know, it's, well, it's not free. Uh, well, we should, you know, have green energy. OK, I'm in favor of green energy, but it can't do the job. And we go on and on and on down this list of all these things that the left has managed to inflict upon us. And the entire country has come to realize through just hard experience that, that none of this stuff works or makes sense. So so now they've lost the bludgeon. They've lost the, the lever that has allowed them to overrule the American people, which is extremely ironic for a party called the Democratic Party, extremely ironic for a party that constantly talks about democracy. What we're seeing now is we are seeing the effect of the republic slowing down what they claim the democracy wants to do, but they don't even have the democracy because if they did, they'd have the legislation and they, and they don't. So yeah, they're having a, they're having a, an enormous uh, conniption fit and it's going to get worse. And, and this is the thing I've noticed about the left from back 25, 30 years ago. They, they, they've got an, they've got something that they like, the law is in their favor, then the law is absolutely sacred. If something happens, legally happens, and, and they don't get the result they want, then that law has to be changed. And then that will stay in place until something happens the other way, then they'll change it back. They have no, they're not adults, Scott. They're not allowed to play. They don't play with others. They, they're not mature enough to handle the essence of a, dem of a democratic republic, which is sometimes you get the bear and sometimes the bear gets you. And, and if you're not prepared for that, then you really don't belong here. And they don't. So expect a lot of this. And just, just in closing, I think the Constitution as written is, uh, is, is essentially a perfect document. The only flaw I can see in the Constitution, if we just read it and, 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 and obeyed it, we'd be fine. I think the only thing in the Constitution I find that, that I would have some, some point in changing, only point, would be that the Constitution doesn't specify the number of Supreme Court justices. So when they've got the majority, the nine justices is, is, is sacred law. But when all of a sudden we've got five justices, now the court has been packed, you see. Now we have to add justices so we can regain that bludgeon back. So there's no respect for the rules. And you've got to understand when you're fighting people who don't believe in the rules, you've got to play the game differently. Well, and of course, uh, viewers who have read a little bit of history will understand the strategy that we're hearing from a lot of politicians right now about court packing, meaning adding more justices to the Supreme Court, increasing that number of justices. Um, this was something that came up uh, during the Roosevelt administration, one of the Roosevelt administrations, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, when uh, he started, th you know, they were basically making noises that they were going to pack the court. And what that did was serve as a brushback pitch to the Supreme Court to basically say, hey, you better you better stop doing what you've been doing. Otherwise, you're going to wind up in the minority because I'm going to appoint a bunch of new justices. And so what we're seeing today is another attempt to to throw that brushback pitch to, to get the conservatives so-called on the court to back away. Um, I, I do a little bit of amateur software development, and it occurs to me that the use of the Supreme Court to accomplish um, what the ends that you wish to see in society is kind of like what I call in software development a workaround. Uh, when I run up into an obstacle, either in, in my own knowledge or in limitations, like I'm, I'm working on an app and there's a limit to how many records you can access with a single query against a database. And so I got to go, okay, I can only access 3,000 records or 2,000 records. So I got to do this and I got to do this. And so what I do is develop an elaborate workaround so that I can bypass the stamped in stone limitation. <laughs> and uh, usually that works for a little while. But then eventually what happens is you wind up eating up more resources than you should. You wind up with conflicts within the software where one thing is conflicting with another and is shutting things down. And eventually you have to find some other solution because your workaround inevitably breaks down. When you use the Supreme Court as a workaround for the democratic processes that are built into this Republican constitution, uh, then you wind up with the same problems. It's a short-term fix, but it's not going to stick forever. Now, if you are uh, so-called progressive on the issue of abortion and you want to see, not necessarily, I'm not saying that everybody wants to see more abortions, but if you want to see more freedom, as you would call it, for women to have abortions, the reality is the Dobbs decision is going to get you that in some states.
because some states are going to react and, and contrary to what the court has said with regard to the relationship of abortion in the Constitution, they're going to say, oh my goodness, we don't want to ban abortions and places like Texas might ban abortions. So therefore, we are going to become more liberal. We're going to become, we're going to fund these things for you. We're going to provide it as, you know, mm -hmm. it's like milk and cheese from the government. We're going to hand this out. We're going to pay for your transportation to get you to the clinic. We're going to pay for people from neighboring states to come to the clinic. And so you will actually see a rise in abortions in some states. And, um, and you're probably unlikely to see an overall reduction in the number of abortions. So I, a pro-life Christian conservative, look at this decision and say, it was correctly decided on the basis of the Constitution and the Supreme Court's appellate judiciary position, and they did the right thing procedurally. Does it produce the outcome that I want? Probably not. I mean, in spots and places it will. There will be fewer abortions in, in some places, but ultimately people are still going to die. Do I like that? No, I don't, I don't like it when people die. Is there anything I can do about it? Well, I could become active in my state and make sure that fewer people die in my state, but I can't control what happens in every other state. So the solution that I want requires a spiritual rebirth. It requires an internal change in the hearts and minds of individuals across the nation. It can't be done by government. And so when the Supreme Court votes in a way I like, or votes in a way I don't like on a moral question, neither one is cause for rejoicing or overall grief on my part because I realize that doesn't really solve the problem. The real problem of abortion is not a problem of jurisdiction. It's a problem of the human heart. And the real problem with the way the left is seeing this Dobbs decision right now or some of the other decisions that they think are so disgusting is a failure to understand the role of the Supreme Court and frankly, a lack of conviction on their part that the things they care most about would enjoy majority support in any legislature in any state in the country. For Bill Whittle and Stephen Green, I'm Scott Odd. Thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com for making Right Angle possible. 